Hello everyone, uh, welcome to session two um, of our literature enrichment course on Charlotte Perkins Gilman's The Yellow Wallpaper. Um, last session we had um, an introduction to CPG, as I affectionately call her, um, and her life and her um, aims through her writing, and we also looked at feminist literary theory. So just to recap today then, I would like you please, and you will have to pause this um, video to be able just to jot something down, um, just to complete these two tasks. So summarize what CPG argued through her writing in, in hopefully one sentence, and just summarize what you understand feminist literary theory to be in one sentence. So pause now, have a go at that. Okay, welcome back. So I'm just going to um, show you what I've written, which may help. Um, so CPG argued that trapping women in the domestic sphere restricted their creativity and made society worse. Um, and then feminist literary theory explores the role of gender in the writing and interpretation of texts. So just remember that when we look at literary theory, it's not just about where the writer was coming from, but also how we would then interpret the text with, dependent, you know, with our different glasses on. And was the analogy I used last uh, session. And um, so we're, we're reading um, the yellow wallpaper, or we will read the yellow wallpaper with our feminist literary theory glasses on. Um, so we, we need to be looking at, at that. Um, so the aim for today's session is to read the text. I'm not going to read it to you, you'll be pleased to know. And I'm not actually going to talk that much. Or I hope I'm not. It's going to be more, um, you know, handing over to you to do some work and to do some reading. So. The first thing I'd like you to do, and you will obviously have to pause the video to be able to do this, is to read the text through from beginning to end. Um, it, there is um, a PDF document in the assignment details here um, with the PDF, um, but there's also a link to an audio book version too. So obviously you can listen along, um, you can listen and read along at the same time. Um, the audio book is the full version of a collection of short stories by Charlotte Perkins Gilman. The Yellow Wallpaper is the first one. That's quite convenient for us. So um, get ready to read. Pause me now. Hello, welcome back. I bet you wish you could pause me in real life, eh, when I'm teaching you. Uh, right, so this is what you're going to do. Again, obviously you're going to have to pause. I'd like you to go back through the, the story now and start looking at these pages and thinking about the answers to these questions. Some of them are easy peasy questions, you know, you can just read it there. Um, and others are sort of trying to get you to work out um, how the narrator's feeling, for example. So, oh, excuse me. Um, there are two pages of questions, so we'll do those first, and then what I'll do is I'll take us back then and we'll go through and I'll, I'll discuss um, some of the answers with you. So pause me, answer these questions. Welcome back, here's the next page. Um, so this is the final page of questions, so just pause me and answer these questions. Hello. So by now you sh should have um, read the text twice, once fully and the second time looking at these questions and you should have answered those those questions. So what I'm going to do um, is just do this. So we've got the questions on one side as best I can. I can't squidge that any smaller um, and the text on this side. So the first question asks um, us to explain as best we can what's wrong with the narrator and what she's been advised to do. Um, she doesn't agree and what does she think would improve? So if we go down to page four, you can see in this paragraph here. Um, oh, can I highlight? That's quite exciting. Oh, so in this paragraph here, um, her husband um, and her brother um, have both said that there's nothing really the matter with, with her, <laughs> but a temporary nervous depression, a slight hysterical tendency. Now. This might pique your interest um, and you might want to do some research and that's, you know, excellent A-level um, thinking there is that what were Victorian attitudes to mental health? Um, I will touch on this later in, in, the, in the series. Um, the Victorians had, um, I'm saying the Victorians, obviously it's set in America, so I shouldn't really call it the Victorian period. Um, in the 19th century, um, there was almost an obsession um, in the medical profession um, 
with mental health. Um, they didn't know a lot. They had really some quite crazy ideas. And um, if you think, particularly my classes I'm thinking of now, that we had, we did look at attitudes to mental illness in the 1930s when it came to of mice and men, and we spoke about lobotomies and asylums and the threat um, of those things for Lenny, um, which which forced George's hands to an extent. Um, well, this is you know 40 years. 50 years before that. So you can imagine um, the attitudes to people who suffered with mental health issues. Um, some, many people argue that the mental health issues that we have nowadays are not new. They've always been there. Um, it's just that they didn't have names. There was a lack of understanding um, <clears throat> and, and a really a, la a lack of treatment as well, of course. If we look at that phrase here, hysterical tendency, I, I want to, how do I get rid of that? Oh, I have to leave it now. If you look at that phrase here, hysterical tendency, this word here, hysterical, comes from the Greek for womb. Um, so um, early medicine believed that women um, had hysterical womb, um, hysterical wombs, um, had hysterical tendencies because they believed that their wombs would move around their body um, and, you know, could cause madness if it reached the brain. Um, muteness if it reached the throat um you know that sort of idea and it sort of would travel around the body and, and the treatments that were given to women who were deemed to be hysterical um aimed to return the womb to its rightful place now they've moved on from there really uh, by 1890 but the idea of um women being hysterical still existed they just didn't believe that the womb moved around it and they knew it was something to do with um the brain and what they believed was that um, women and men were physiologically very different and there are obvious differences, but they believe that they were their, their sort of mental capacities were different as well. And that women um, were more susceptible to sort of nervous dispositions um, like our narrator apparently has. And we'll find out. So we'll, we'll be able to get an inkling as to what was really wrong with her later. Um, or what she was really suffering with. I don't want to say wrong with her, but what she was suffering with later. Um, so she's advised to, you know, cease any work. You know, for, it says here forbidden to work. Um, she is um, to, to take some kind of crazy, you know, chemical um, concoction. Um, she doesn't really know what it is, but she's taking it blindly because her husband tells her to. Um, and she's to, you know, have little walks and get some fresh air and that sort of thing. Um, and she's absolutely forbidden to work. Um, she says she disagrees. And then she says, personally, I believe that um, congenial work with excitement and change would do me good. You know, she, she really thinks that to be stimulated and um, to be sort of mentally stimulated would do her good, um, but she is forbidden. So page five, the setting and what's mysterious about its past. So we've, we're told here, um, that there was some legal trouble, um, heirs and co heirs, and the place has been empty for years. Um, that's what's mysterious about its past. Um, and I'll ask you in subsequent sessions to look more closely at the descriptions of the settings. So I'm not going to go into massive detail there. Um, and what do we learn about their marriage on this page? Um, well, basically, that she'll, she'll do as she's told. Um, He's quite dismissive of her. If we look at this bit, um, I said to John one moonlit, um, moonlight evening um, that, you know, she could feel something strange. And he said what I felt was a draft and shut the window. So he's quite dismissive of her um, concerns. She gets unreasonably angry. Um, and sort of he's the doctor and the husband and, and you know, tells her what to do. She does... Um, they don't start again. She has very little choice in anything here. Um, she doesn't like the room. She wants to go downstairs where she can go out onto the piazza, which is like, you know, like a patio, if you like. Um, so she can have a little walk, but he wouldn't hear of it. He said there was only one window and not room enough for two beds um, and no near room for him if he took another. To have two beds was... was um, quite traditional in those days to sleep in separate beds don't panic too much about that but um and, and then she goes on to say he's very careful and loving you know and hardly lets me stir without special direction you know so she's not really allowed to do anything unless he sort of 
told her. Um, I'm like, that sounds more controlling. I, I've put that in a way that makes him sound super controlling. Um, you know, you, you can read into that as you will. And so page six, then just before the break at the bottom of the page, we discover a little more about the narrative. Um, if we go down to page six, here is the break. OK, and um, so just before that. Um, she says, there comes John and I must put this away. He hates to have me write a word. And that gives us the idea that she is writing down her thoughts. This this short story is her diary almost if you like um, and so it tells us about the narrative there um, she's recording her story in a sort of diary and if we think about it it goes completely against what she's been told by her husband she's been told not to do anything creative um, page seven who is mary right um, she's unable to get dressed, you know, and he was doing anything. It is fortunate Mary is so good with the baby, such a dear baby. And yet I cannot be with him. It makes me so nervous. Um, so Mary is a, is a nanny and is looking after a baby. And it's here that we discover, discover that she has recently given birth. Now, if we were to think from a modern perspective, it really seems, and the more we read about this story, it really seems that she was suffering from postpartum depression, postnatal depression, um, which is so common, um, but completely misunderstood um, back in, in, you know, in the 1800s. Um, so that, that gives us a little idea. Uh, page eight. Oh, she says, I think sometimes that if I were only well enough to write a little, it would relieve the press of ideas and rest me. And what do you think um, she means by that? I'm going to find it first because I are here. Um, now, that section there is, I think, the basis of the whole story, you know, the point of the whole story, um, which is that she wants to relieve the pressure and her anxiety through being creative, through expressing herself. I feel that the writer is, the narrator, I should say, is a highly um, creative woman clearly you know when we start thinking we, we, we consider what she starts to see in the wallpaper um, and the stories that she makes up um, about this wallpaper she's clearly very creative and what John has done by suppressing um, that creativity is actually make it pop out somewhere else so if she, she's hit the nail on the head there without realizing she sort of foreshadowed her own story because I think perhaps if she were allowed to write a little it would relieve the press of ideas on her. You know, she's got all of this creativity pent up inside. And if she were only able to, to write, then that creativity could come out onto paper. Because actually, by the end of the novel, we, uh, by the end of the story, we see that she doesn't have the opportunity to write properly, only in fits and starts, and she writes this diary for us, um, that she, her creativity comes out in other ways. It comes out through through imagining what she can see in the wallpaper. Um, and that's quite important because, um, and we'll talk about this later, but it's that notion of um, what would have cured her. Um, and, and what she's going through here is something called the rest cure, um, which was a... 19th century notion for what would cure women of basically thinking and, and um, having ideas beyond their station. Um, and we'll, we'll learn about that um, a little bit in subsequent sessions. Um, but it's that idea, isn't it, that oh, I can't think of an analogy. I've got one in my head, but I can't explain it. You know, if you push down on, on a balloon, the, the the plastic stretches elsewhere doesn't it to to relieve the pressure um and that's what she's doing she's rather than sort of opening the end of the balloon and letting slowly all of that pressure and creativity out through writing through poetry through you know whatever she may want to do what's actually happening is that's been tied in a knot um and she's the pressure's getting bigger and bigger and bigger and it's sort of popping out here and there and eventually it's going to burst and, and absolutely it does um um, page nine, what is the narrator obsessed with? The wallpaper. She's obsessed with the wallpaper. Um, 
she's talking about it here you know it, it goes over and over and um, there's a recurrent spot um on the wallpaper blah, blah blah and it goes on and on she goes on and on and on for a very long time she goes to talk about the floor and the furniture in between but she comes back she keeps coming back to down here the paper um and we'll, you know, we'll think about that as we go ahead. So page 10 then, just before the break, what does the narrator believe she sees? Um, in the places where it isn't faded and where the sun is just so, I can see a strange, provoking, formless sort of figure seems to skulk about behind that silly and conspicuous front design. So she is seeing the beginnings of a, of a formless figure behind the design. Um, and, and you know that obviously you know the story you've read it now so you know what that um uh manifests itself into as we move forward um that quotation then from page 11 um i lay i lie here on this great immovable bed it is nailed down i believe and follow the pattern about by the hour um she is clearly obsessed you know she is following the pattern <laughs> Um, by the hour, you know, that means for hours on end, she can look at the path then and follow it around. Um, is she mad or is she driven mad by not being able to be creative? And that therein lies the, the argument of the whole, um, the whole story. I think it's quite interesting to see here that um, she lies down on the um, immovable bed that's nailed down um, and that's... Uh, a hint to what the room was. It was a nursery, and the um, and the beds were nailed down, and they they were, you know. That's, but it's also sort of foreshadowing where she could end up um, if this gets any worse. You know, sort of nailed down um, and strapped down almost into a bed in some kind of asylum. So that's um, quite scary. And the point is, isn't there? There's nothing else for her to do. She's occupied with that wallpaper. Um, because it's the only stimulation that she has or the only outlet for her creativity is sort of making up stories and seeing things in that wallpaper. Um, page 13 then, what does she see in the wallpaper? Um, uh, there we go here. It's always the same shape that she sees, only very numerous. There's lots of them. And it is like a woman stooping down and creeping about behind that pattern. Um, I wish John would take me away from here. She doesn't like it, but she sees a woman. And this is where um, CPG, as um, she's fondly known now, um, Charlotte Perkins Gilman begins to use that wallpaper. Well, she's been using it the whole time, but um, here is where I'm beginning to talk about it um, to show that this woman is trapped behind the patterns of the wallpaper, thus reflecting our narrator being trapped behind the literal bars on the windows of the nursery, but also on those figurative um, bars. Society, um, society's view of women, society's view of mental health. Um, so that woman behind the wallpaper could be, you know, our, our narrator. Um, yes. Anyway. Um, so um, page 18, the narrator discusses the smell. Now, this is where we get less abstract and conceptual and I think in a more literary devices. Um, so if we look here, um, she says there's something else about the paper, the smell. Um, and wherever I go, whether the windows are open or not, the smell is here. It creeps all over the house. I find it hovering in the dining room, skulking in the parlour, hiding, lying um, in wait for me on the stairs. You know, it's that personification of the smell. If we think back to Of Mice and Men and the section in chapter three where we're waiting for Carlson to shoot Candy's dog. And it's that silence. The silence was in the room now. The silence invaded the room. It's that sonification of um, a concept. Here it is the smell of the, the wallpaper. And our question asks us, um, what technique and, and you to make it seem horrific and how is it effective? Well, it's effective because it's these verbs here. It's, it's not just a personification itself. It's what is it being um, written to do? Creep, hover, skulk, hide, lie in wait. You know, it sounds as if the smell is getting ready to attack our narrator. Um, I love this here as well, a yellow smell. 
you know, what is a yellow smell? Um, and she is so preoccupied with that wallpaper, with the obviously the yellow wallpaper, and um, that even the smell is taking on the colour of the wallpaper now. Um, what it also tells us as well is that she, wherever she goes in the house now, the wallpaper is following her, um, so she can't escape it. Uh, or she feels like it's following her as well. You know, we need to bear that in mind that this is a first person narrative, it's her version, um, which is a, another session that we'll look at uh, later on. So page 20, after the break, um, how is the, and this is this section here, how is the um, relationship between her and John now uh, presented? Now, if you think at the beginning when she was sort of like, John loves me and cares for me, I know he's doing everything, you know, he's so well, all of that lovely, lovely things. Now, she says, um, <clears throat> I believe John is beginning to notice that she's trying to get the paper off. And I don't like the look in his eyes. Um, John knows I don't sleep up well at night. Um, he asks me all sorts of questions and pretends to be loving and kind, as if I couldn't see through him. So she's beginning now to think of John as um, more of a villain um, than a than an ally, um, or an enemy than an ally, I should say. She doesn't seem to trust him anymore. She thinks his questions are a front. Um, and she thinks that both John and Jenny, um, sister, um, that they they are must be affected by the wallpaper as well. They're just keeping it a secret, you know. But it's that relationship he seems to have here have broken down, and and she is suspicious of John. Um, and then finally, um, page twenty two, which is almost the end. Um, she says, I wonder if they all came out of that wallpaper as I did. And who does the narrator now believe she is? She thinks she has been or was one of the women um, behind the wallpaper. Here's where she says it. And she says, I suppose I shall have to get back behind the pack when it comes at um, night. And that is hard. Um, so she, she thinks she's one of the women behind the wallpaper and if we remove ourselves from the story and think um, as 21st century readers we need to think Charlotte Perkins Gilman has constructed this short story um, so what is CPG saying well actually she she is one of the women trapped behind the wallpaper because the narrator's story is representative of what happened to lots and lots and lots of women of the period um, who suffered from what we now understand to be post heart and depression. Um, they didn't know what it was then, but you know, they Charlotte Perkins Gilman could see that women were treated unfairly um, and when it came to mental health. So, you know, she's she's using our narrator as a representation of all women. So having lots of women behind that wallpaper, perhaps is Charlotte Perkins Gilman saying there are lots of women beyond this story, suffering from the same issues. Oh, I said I wasn't going to talk very much. I absolutely love this story. I think it's fantastic. Um, yeah, so it was um, brilliant. So let me um, just get this back up here because it's just one little thing I, I, I want you to do. Um, so after I've shut up and closed this video down, I do want you to think about what you've read. Um, make a note of how you could imply, um, imply, write a note of how you could apply a feminist reading to this story as you did with Where the Wild Things Are. Um, so I've hinted in, in my um, discussion with myself um, some of those ideas, but there are quite a few more. Um, so go back to your notes on feminist literary theory. Um, use the PowerPoint because um, this is in the assignment as well. So you can go back to those slides to have a look again. And we will discuss at the beginning of the next session um, some interpretations that could be made um, with our feminist literary theory glasses on. OK, so have a little reflect on this story. Um, that is the end of session two. Um, I don't know what we do next. Oh, yeah, there we go, session three. So next session, we'll we'll look at um, symbolism um, and how it is used by Charlotte Perkins Gilman. Um, so just as um, a summary then, what we've looked at in terms of A-level study here um, in today's session is obviously we've got that assessment objective that is concerned with 
the um, interpretation of others um, when applied to, to texts. Um, we've also looked at context. Um, and what we've done is get, get to grips with the text as a whole, um, which would lead us to assessment, assessment objective one, which is that notion of um, your engagement with a, the with a text, um, your sort of creative reading of a text, uh, the questions you ask of it, the uh, route you go down when studying it um, and writing about it, that sort of thing. So we're looking at uh, from a general point of view. When we come to session three, where we start to look at symbolism, that's when we go to assessment objective two, which is looking at um, the literary uh, um, and sometimes, but not this session, but sometimes linguistic devices that are used by writers. Um, and that's what we'll be looking at next time. So hopefully that was useful. Hopefully that got your brains in gear. Um, this really is a useful um, bridging unit for your um, 10s and 11s thinking of taking uh, literature at A-level. It, it really is useful. Um, so I hope you're all keeping well and um, I'll speak to you again soon. Bye-bye.